uh, welcome to another Coffee with Sam. So where we speak with ASX companies and uh, uh, the guys who run these uh, companies and we hear what the stories are. Uh, we're here at the University Club in Crowley um, on the University of Western Australia campus. It's all about Venture Minerals, ASX coat is VMS. Uh, market cap currently is about 48 million. So uh, I've got Andrew Rodronjic back here again with us and this time we're going to be trying to get that tin story out. Andrew, welcome back to Coffee with Sam. So, look, Andrew, the, what I want to do today is really about that tin story because I think oh, we've talked about the projects and how we're going to get the tin, but really what is the tin market about? What, what is, is significant on tin, why we're talking about tin? Uh, you've been just recently to a tin conference, which I thought would be perfect timing. Um, give us the rundown on what they are talking about at the moment. Look, uh, yeah, thanks, Noel. It's good. It's good to be uh, good to be back, and um, we haven't spoken for a little while. But uh, look, uh, the tin conference is, um, you know, a great opportunity uh, last month to uh, to get um, the um, an update on where where the tin world's at, and certainly, you know, venture. You know, we were, I suppose, if you like, leading the re-education of of the planet, the industry about what, you know, what tin was used and, you know, when we did this back in, you know, circa 2010, you know, tin was uh, all about uh, lead-free solder and it was a big transformation from having 40% lead in your solder to 4% silver and the rest would be, 96% would be tin. And, you know, in 2010 we sort of led the charge along with our colleagues at, uh, at Casbar Resources, uh, you know, Adventure and Casbar out there telling the world about this and tin hit 33,000 US dollars a tonne so that was you know a record price back in in 2010 but um, you know it's uh, you know we were well known in, in the tin sector but you know now we're sort of we're back back you know rejoined at, you know the tin organization international tin associations it's called now the name did change slightly but you know back an explorers and developers group and uh, you know good timing we're updating our feasibility study we're going underground um, it's, di it's a different, smaller, higher grade project and, um, and certainly for us I, I wanted to go there and, and listen to you know, other members of the tin, tin world and you know, unfortunately there, China wasn't represented because of obviously the lockdown situation in China but you know, to hear the you know, major players like Indonesia and Peru, the guys at Minsu got you know, probably the, uh, the, the best tin project in the world, the highest one at uh, San Rafael, um, talk about what they're doing in the sector and, and, and certainly you know to, to elaborate further on that uh, Indonesia uh, announced that uh, you know very much what they did in nickel is that the country wants to do value add so it, it will be looking to ban exports of concentrate of tin from uh, sometime this year like very very soon and and when you think about um, China, no, not China, but so Indonesia has about around about 25, 30 percent of the world's tin production. Uh, that's quite significant. So, um, and you know, what could happen is that, well, so what is happening is that Indonesia, well, basically, got up there and said we are seeking investment to build these downstream facilities. And you know, we don't want to produce bars of bars of tin, or, or, or more likely solder, or get into the electronics side of things, or even chemicals, you know, because. You know, like tin's not about tin plating. Tin plates are like 12% of the use. It's all about solder, which is like, you know, 49% of the use. So, and that was part of that re-education process back in 2010. But, you know, if that happens, then, you know, there's, there's the ability for China to, you know, they, they produce around just under 50%. that They could, if they invest into downstream facilities and, and, and they buy that end product, then they could be controlling you know, closer to 70, 75 percent of the tin in the world, which would be, you know, interesting play when you compare that. Very similar to a rare earth or even tungsten, and uh, you know, which is obviously uh, part of this very quickly emerging battle between the superpowers of China and the U.S. and uh, and the change in the whole global uh, dynamics, where all of a sudden we're going back to being nationalistic. Uh, this is all kind of like pre-Berlin Wall falling days, where you know, just going back to tungsten for a second, where the US dumped its strategic stockpile of tungsten in the market because there was no longer a Cold War. But that Cold War is well and truly back, albeit uh, two different uh, uh, countries, you know, China and, and the US. But um, 
you know, that was one aspect of, you know, you know it was you know, a big announcement you know, to come out and I think it had a, you know, I think there's a, there's a fair degree of shock about it in, in, the, in the tin world and, and, and maybe the rest of the world hasn't really quite cottoned on to that. Um, I suppose one clear message at the conference was uh, a lot of the countries are in high risk ESG or high risk ESG jurisdictions and, and there was a huge emphasis. So all the countries operating in, in the DRC or in South America or in Asia are talking about ESG and that's something that was sustainability. Um, there's something that, you know, you know, there was a company cut, stood up with an Australian asset and said, I don't have to talk about that because we're in Australia, which is ver very true, but obviously we still got to do it but um, and some are better placed than others for example our project's got hydropower and that other project didn't have access to hydropower but renewable energy but but certainly the other it's a big thing for those other ones because they've got to convince you know the funds in the uk and i spoke to many fund fund managers in in, in london uh, last month um and, and many in new york uh, before just before the team conference and and esg is at the forefront of the box they need to tick in terms of investment into you know helping companies like us build these assets and um, so that's another aspect and, and the, tin, the tin's quite well placed because of the tracing systems they put in and there's a tin code 7.3 and you know trying to meet that sort of uh, United Nations goal of trying to achieve you know um, you know net zero emissions and all that um, you know tin's well placed to do that it has the necessary steps, but then you've got to meet those guidelines. And I suppose what we got out of it is that there is a possibility of getting a premium for a green tin product. You know, that may emerge over the coming years and, and, and certainly that would help venture, in Venture's case. And last but not least, we, you know, we heard from the guys in the solder industry and that was very interesting. Um, you, know, you know, for example, obviously, we talk a bit about semiconductors, and semiconductors don't have tin, you know, there's actually tungsten in semiconductors, but to stick the semiconductor onto the circuit board, you need four blobs of glue, better known as solder, which are 96% tin, so they are quite closely related. And uh, what an interesting aspect of that presentation was that um, there's this, again, there's this superpower war on semiconductor production, and Taiwan is in control, and, and China, is well ahead of the race in the US. It's invested $150 billion on, on making those factories. And I think there's about three types of those that need to be able to um, produce semiconductors. And they've, they're out there spending that money now, whereas you know, this solder group, well, they're lobbying the government in the US. There's a bill up in front to spend $50 billion to build that. So the US is very good at designing but not very good at manufacturing and building semiconductors, and that's where there's a huge disconnect. So there's a map showing that, you know, there's lots of there's factories in the US are being built, or hubs, or uh, where they, they build these and design, design these things, but where they build them, it's the imbalances that it, it goes straight back into, into China. Um, so, uh, yeah, so may, maybe there'll be some deal to be had with South Korea or, or Japan to build these because, it's certainly the US is way behind. So yeah, look, um, I suppose three very interesting points, Indonesia, uh, ESG or sustainability, um, and, and clearly the, you know, the, the demand for solid is gonna well and truly outstrip what supply is going forward. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the little hiccup in the price we've had now, the tins come off you know, from 37,000 or even as high as in the 50, low 50s briefly uh, back in March. Um, you know, I think that's a blip in the radar going forward. And I think, you know, when you talk about your mobile phone's got four cents or maybe even today three cents worth of tin in it or 0.7 of a gram, um, you know, if the tin price goes to $100,000, it'll become nine cents. So it has no impact. It's, it's called the spice metal, a little bit of tin of everything. You know, the price could go to $200,000 and it still would make a difference to your iPhone. So. That's the interesting dynamic, and if the world wants sustainable tin, then it's going to have to pay for it, essentially. I want to touch on the point you, you, know, you talked about, about what Indonesia is doing. Obviously, it's, it's trying to grow its own economy by, by forcing downstream into the, into the, um, in the economy. But that also means that, you know, as we know, this, how they mine their tin there is not quite sort of kosher to some degree. And... Do you think that, you know, um, with the whole ESG thing, 
I think that's a big play in, in going forward because there's always this about being, you know, clean and green, etc. Which is, it's it's not fact yet. It's it's future thing. But the fact that now um, um, Indonesia is going down this, that means that locks up all that concentrate. It's not going anywhere. It's got to be producing. And if you remember the nickel part of the story, uh, it took a long time for that to happen, for the plants to get developed, and it took years before it actually created any flow of income for for that sector so would that really move then the, the the price of tin do you think well look uh you know it's certainly the investors are chasing you know from the fund managers the esg component we, we heard that i was at the amac forum yesterday and, and, and that's it's coming to australia canada and australia are behind there's no there's clearly I saw, I saw that but that'll that'll change so if the investors are driving this from from the US and, and from uh, Europe, then are they going to be buying products from China? Is this where it's going to go down? Where, can can China prove from the supply chain that, that tin didn't come from Myanmar, from an area that had been raped and pillaged in the Shan province, which is what they've been doing, and flooding the market with tin and affecting the price because they continue to buy those products. If Indonesia, same, but same, same situation, if Indonesia is dredging the seafloor, which is what it's doing at the moment, and 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 uses that tin and it's all keeping internalized but in the day out comes this solder or or whatever this downstream product well hang on well apple and samsung etc may go no we don't want your tin mm. you have actually your supply go down the supply chain you can't prove that it hasn't had modern day slavery it's been sustainably sourced all these esg components and all of a sudden, you know, that happens, and, and I'm just not it's going to happen overnight. Mm. And these things never do, but, but there's this gradual change, and we can see the movement that's happening. You know, the world's changed. It's, you know, you can, these sort of things happen after catastrophic global events, and, and obviously COVID is one of those events. It's like having a world war, and there's a dramatic change, and, and, and because everyone's in the mood for change, this sort of thing, these sort of things may occur, but... but um, yeah, look, it's uh, you know, I came out of the meeting thinking, well, if I if I sold to to the tin to an offtake party, and it's quite interesting when you think about it, um, do I need to go downstream further before I sell? You know, like if I'm, you know, is is it is it when I look at the tin plants, where do they sit? And they sit is Malaysia, in Fort Butterworth, which is uh, MSC, that's a big one. Um, the, in Phuket, we've got Taisako, and then we, and then a fair, fair number, majority of the rest are in China. And there's obviously smelters, in China, and sometimes there's quite small smelters, like in the, the Bank of Bellington Islands. And and uh, you know, does that go into the LME coffers in in Rotterdam? Um, and you know, will that start getting scrutiny? You know, there's not many, you know. But when I met, uh, I was in the UK, they're talking about, oh, build a tin smelter, or, or uh, and Australia can send its concentrate to the one in the UK, maybe for the South Crofty mine, if that gets developed. Or, uh, you know, the American group said, oh, we, we can't take um, concentrate, but we can take ignits, you know, so should, should venture go downstream and build a, a tin smelter? Because we can't wait for rentails to build one in, in Metals X. And Metals X is, at the end of the day, half Chinese, a lot, of, a lot of assets, and maybe China's a bit smarter than the Australian investor, but MMG owned Rosebury, uh, Savage River's half owned by a Chinese steel mill, um, so most of them are already gone, better assets are already gone. So being a 50-50 joint venture, they're never gonna agree to build a smelter. So maybe a smelter will never be built, and maybe eventually needs to look at downstreaming. That's, that's sort of what I got out of it, because I need to control my supply chain if I wanna have a green tin label and get a green tin premium for example and, put, and produce a bar of four nines tin if i can do that then maybe that's a more value add pro product so you know we're, we're looking at that as part of our pre-feasibility study i'm not saying we are going to do it and it kind of does depend a little bit if, if tin you know deservedly gets on the critical mineral list and it's about time the australian government rethought about that and uh because without solder there is no iphone there's nothing electronic, so it just needs to, you know, reassess that list and put tin on there and get these assets built. And where do we supply those products to 
Europe or, or uh, North America, doesn't really matter. I can tell you now, Canada's got no assets for tin and tungsten, basically. So, uh, or tungsten, so it does have. There's a Mangtung or Kangtung projects. Uh, but uh, certainly for tin, it hasn't got anything in North America, so. Look, I think the um, dark horse, in my opinion, is that if you look at China, I mean, a lot of people we, we, we're, we're potentially seeing some sort of a, you know, Cold War happening, you know, but China's into development, and I think, I think a lot of people, if they look at it from this side of it, if they start thinking, hey, you know, I, I want those green tin too. I want that, that that value add. Um, you know, they're not that silly to be tarnishing their own products without having that because. In the, at the end of the day, they're still competing, right? The local people who buy the internal e economics are still going to say, I'd rather have that instead of something that inferior, you know? Marketing, right? As you say, price dictates quality, right? Doesn't. So I think if that was happening, this premium part that you're talking about could be actually not such a far fetched concept, in, in my opinion, because going forward, um, it's where you get it from, right? At the end of the day, and, and the rest of the world, as we know, where the, a lot of this come from, is done not ESG compliant, as we've seen in, in the article. Um, so going there, I mean, price, you know, we've seen the price run to 50, nearly 50, coming back to 32. Did they have any feedback on that in the conference? Look, um, you know, admittedly, post-conference, the uh, the commodity market's got a bit more of a shakedown, if you like. Um, so, uh, but you know, like I said, I think it looks looks pretty short term. And um, so, I, you know, I think I think the view is that you know over the last decade, the average is twenty thousand. But you know, we've had this sort of paradigm shift in the pricing. So, you know, I think what you're seeing now is you know we haven't seen below thirty thousand for eighteen months, essentially. So, um, you know, I think. This is probably a rare opportunity to buy some cheap tin, if you like, you know, in my view. Um, and, uh, but, you know, people, you know, we've got inflation, people always look at getting the cheapest product possible. So it's always gonna be that battle between paying a premium versus just taking a cheaper product. But, you know, talking to people are going, oh, I went and bought this uh, washing machine that was made in, in Italy, instead of buying the Chinese version, and paid more. They went, oh, I paid more, happy to pay more. So, but the problem is, you know, is everyone going to make that decision? You know, at the end of the day, China's been able to, to be the masters of, of, you know, mass production, getting the cost down, and, and that's why it had created a market share doing that way. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's what Japan did that even. And, and China, you know, have done that. And, uh, but the cost of everything is, is going up, and, you know, that for various reasons, like obviously oil, and that translates to freight, and that translates to the bottom line of products. We've seen all that, but um, you know, um, yeah. Look, it's uh, it's. I don't think it'll happen overnight, but you know, the the, the LME has a uh, sustainable, uh, res responsibly sourced uh, mantra in there, and uh, and certainly, you know, if it stops accepting, you know, um, tin from other places and. Yeah, how are you going to how are you going to prove that it is responsibly sourced? I think the world's not kind of been really ready for that, and how to, maybe the China will ad, will adapt. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. It's, it's hard to to speculate the answer. Um, there are uh, the right answer, but as usual, it's probably a combination of things, and, and usually the market sort of levels these these things out a little bit. But um, you know, there, there may be a case where. There won't be a lot of this sort of premium green tin, if you like, available around the world. So, um, you know, I think um, because most of those are struggling to get it done. And that's the problem, you know, if you're generating something in the middle of Africa or in South, in South America, you're just going to be really struggling and um, to, to meet those uh, requirements. I mean, tin is interesting in, in one as other aspect is that, yes, we've got the, the main use being soldering and things like that, but like kaolin, you know, when we think of kaolin, we think it's just clay, uh, they go into ceramics, and that's their biggest use. 
but there's a lot of movement from that industry that sector to go into high tech they're going into um you know carbon capture and all these kind of things i've noticed in the presentation that that from from your um your conference they talk about these kind of things where they talk about they could be in a lithium ion lithium ion battery component they could be into the anodes they're even talking about um you know next generation batteries and water treatment can you share some light in in what they were talking about when when that part of the presentation was happening yeah there's a there's a guy at uh, ita international tin association dr jeremy pierce who who goes through looking at a vast number of, of uh, scientific papers produced by BH, you know, guys doing PhDs and research, etc. And, and he sort of subsets, looked at 10, and certainly there's a lot of very smart people around the world looking at more efficient uses. And quite often, uh, 10 seems to be you know, a solution that, like, uh, 10 combined with psyllium and a sulfate. Uh, Perscovite, which is uh, used as the um, tin compound in uh, in smart glass solar panels, you know that these these are the sort of things uh, you know where people are going. Oh, how can we make extend the life of a battery or improve the efficiency energy storage? And 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 they're doing these these tin compounds, and that's where this chemical component for tin is about 20% of the usage. And, and again, it's it's not large amounts of tin. But it's seeing that in terms of you know the carbon capture devices, the water treatment, that uh, quite often they're coming up with tin compounds, which are the most efficient use, and those and some of those are quite exciting opportunities, which is hard to predict how much tin will be used. And you know everyone talks about electric vehicles. First problem is battery recharging stations. Recharging stations taking anywhere between 500 grams to a kilo of tin to recharge these things. And, you know, in Australia, while well, I drove around Tasmania on the west coast, there was one, you know, sitting, uh, in a, in, and even in Western Australia, we don't have many down south. So, but in Europe, these things are getting made all over the place. So, you know, that's the, the exciting part of that. The 5G network, which still hasn't kind of, I suppose, stalled a little bit in the roll out of that. Um, you're gonna, you know, because of the short range, you're gonna need a lot of these stations, they're gonna require a lot of circuitry. Um, but you know, it's you know getting getting back to um, you know the application in terms of all these other new ones. Um, you know, I think there's there's an exciting upside, and and International Tin Association does a great job of trying to look at these these other opportunities and promoting them and and working with them in terms of providing um, the data and and maybe access to supply. Where there's there's groups out there now looking for tin for water treatment purposes. I wish I could go and supply them tin right now, but um, you know, that, that's sort of, you've got to be thinking about downstream, hence my thoughts about maybe, you know, building a small tin smelter and producing that, you know, four nines tin bars of tin, which would be great. It's always nice to be holding a gold bar in a gold mine, but anyway, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be a nice situation to get to, but um, you know, sooner rather than later, but uh, yeah, look, it's uh, tin's a very versatile element, and and it just seems to combine with you know things like sulphide, selenium, um, you know, various compounds that sort of um, you know just always end up being the most efficient way of generating either heat or uh, or capturing the carbon, etc. So it's sort of uh, you know it's um, yeah it's interesting and, and certainly. I came across from just from that presentation, you know, pretty excited about the opportunity of that, and a lot of that's not factored in going forward. I mean, not long ago, I was talking to someone about, you know, the, the the wisdom of lithium batteries and things like that, and he said, look, you know, I think China now is uh, one group in China is now committed to actually producing sodium batteries, and that the point I'm trying to make is that as we move forward, as you said, technology changes replace a new technology in terms of how we can use a battery, lithium ion batteries, sodium batteries. I mean, there's always a place for everyone, you know, but with the, the what I want to find out is, you know, with all these new technologies that they talk about, can tin go from, you know, 100, I think it's 100,000 100, tonnes per year use to 300,000 or half of, you know, 
because we're having new products out there that we didn't have before. Yeah, well, look, sorry to, to correct you, no, but it's 400,000 tonnes for an, yeah, 400,000, but uh, can't, well, it, it's, it increased substantially just even last year. I think it went from about 320,000 to 390,000 tonnes. Um, oh, look, the simple answer is, is, is highly likely, highly likely, you know, and, um, you know, as, as, you know, we go through the electrification to achieve this de decarbonisation that needs to be done to, to meet these, these, you know, net zero emission goals, which, you know, Australia's, you know, looking at 43% by 2030, which is, you know, only eight years away, seven, eight years away. And, and then, uh, and then, you know, net zero by 2050. So, you know, to achieve those goals, there needs to be a dramatic change. You just, this, this can't happen and little changes here or there needs to be quite, quite dramatic. Um, and obviously vehicles is one of those, um, but uh, you know every, every aspect of our life needs to be needs to be questioned and, and changed and, and converted. Up in being you know coal-fired power stations will disappear. You know whether we have uh, solar, more solar panels, and I suppose we've already got a fair number of those. More wind power. Uh, you know there's going to be uh, there's on the on the you know on the drawing boards is a wind power and a hydrogen. Um, uh, power generation facility next to Mount Lindsay. So we're in discussion with that group at the moment. So, um, you know, whether that'll fit the timeline of our project, I'm not sure, but, you know, they're talking about a substantial wind farm and there's already a couple of wind farms down there and there's, they're talking about putting a Marnius link in to export more more power. You know, the battery nation concept that, the you know, previous Prime Minister Scott Morrison put out there, you know, there's nowhere else better in Australia to produce that sort of uh, renewable energy than Tasmania because uh, of its, the amount of rain you get on the west coast and the amount of wind that comes through roaring in the roaring 40s, you know, going through the Australian Bight and having an 18 metre waves smacking the west west coast of Tasmania side of it uh, was littered with, sh with shipwrecks from the 1800s. But, um, you know, it's uh, harnessing that, that natural resource and, and and distributing that power to to the mainland is uh, you know you know Tasmania's or net zero emissions already um, and uh, and looking to improve the efficiency of their hydro system in that area hydro power system because the tech they're using the turbines is 80s and 90s type tech um, so they're updating that and looking to do that program over the next five years so you know I think um, you know, we need those sort of massive changes in order to, to achieve those goals. We just can't do that by whooshing around the edges a little bit here or there. It's, um, you know, so you've got to think about, um, you know, robotics, 3D printing, um, you know, AI, all this sort of stuff. Um, this is all for, this is the fourth industrial revolution, you know, it's, it's combining things that are, um, you know, quantum computing, all that sort of stuff. It just needs to be, you know, harnessed and and again it's 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 very much tin's got a big part to play in that and you know and the whole planet's got to change like that so in order to it's, it's a global problem it's not a it's not a problem that just exists in Tasmania or Australia or uh, or even Southeast Asia it's sort of something that the whole world needs needs to be doing so and it'll, it'll take a time to transition through that but um, yeah look it's it's hard to predict but there are no new tin mines on the horizon that are going to be able to achieve that. Obviously, higher prices will allow more more tin, and, and, and but you know the answer has always been alluvial tin. And if alluvial tin's not allowed or frowned upon or not not purchased, then you know we're in a, we're in a, there's a bit of a, there's a huge tightening in the market, and that's why prices are likely to go up. I've spoken before about you know demand goes up. Supplies restricted because of you know ESG legislation or sustainability legislation, and people aren't buying that that uh, cheap dirty tin if you like. Then um, yeah, I can I can see see it going up most definitely. Whether production goes up is debatable because if it's all of a sudden tightened or constricted, but you know if the world goes into its own little starts getting internalised and they just produce enough tin for themselves, then you know that's. It may be split into two different, two different, two different markets. It might be a Chinese market and a, the rest of the world market. I don't know. It's 
I think the um, interesting part for me is in that presentation they talk about the lithium ion or lithium uh, tin sort of solid battery and things like and when when I hear the word solid I'm thinking okay they're not looking for blobs of salt tin right no. I'm thinking okay that if that came true um you know that that production that the need for more tin sort of goes up because I I've, I've looked at alternative batteries the lithium batteries it's probably going back four or five years now and you know they were talking vanadium batteries then and then then they were talking about um, I recently there was something about molly or something in but eventually they come true to some degree right and, and I mean vanadium batteries now pretty almost accepted but they're, they're different there. different kind of place you use them right so it's whereas before everyone thought oh lithium batteries everywhere lithium batteries everywhere but now so it's different playing out um, that's, and you, that's taken 20 years I, I did you know when we did my master in economics I was talking about it in 2001 yeah okay mine battery so yeah how long did that take to become you know t to be commercial and be accepted in the market it took probably 15 years and the other point you made about you know the the actually getting a tin mine up and running it's not an overnight thing it doesn't take months it takes years and you know you guys have had this for almost 10 years 12 years now 15 years what well, let's see so it, it it's about the the moment as well, and you just doesn't wake up. And go, oh, we'll we'll go find a find ourselves a tin project, find ourselves a tin deposit, find ourselves a tin mine. That that takes years, right? So, so if there's a suddenly cut off some sort of supply. Even in, like we've discussed this many many times, this ESG thing was only fifty percent and not ninety percent. It, it's a significant loss of supply. And it's very hard to get that back. Um, look, going forward, I mean, where are you guys at with all your projects and stuff? I mean, we since one component that we've really never focused on. You know, I think it needed that focus, and especially coming off your conference, I think it's a great opportunity to. But you know, what, what's happening with your your projects and such? Yeah, look, we haven't. Uh, you know, we haven't. Uh, we've been knuckling down and. and we're bearing head on the on on the projects, uh, and it hasn't been you know much news flow recently. Um, but uh, you know we are working on towards that you know pre feasibility study, getting out something towards the end of the year. So uh, you know the samples are in the laboratory. You know we've already got a conventional flow sheet. We're just trying to improve the flow sheet. So remembering that we you know for those who haven't heard the story before, we've spent something like forty million dollars on this project. As we said, we've been on it since 2007 as part of our IPO listing. It was called Renison West back then. Um, Peter Cook told me to go and change the name to, to something else, but we came out Lindsay because the tin market wasn't very good back back in uh, the mid noughties But uh, obviously, the world's changed a lot since then, and, and, and Metals X has done a great job. And that it's a great ore body. has been going 130 years, Renison. But anyway, so uh, Mount Lindsay it is, but we've been there, drilled the first hole back in, in uh, 07. So. Um, so, you know, we've spent $40 million, um, so we've drilled out your body. The feasibility study is about doing an underground mine design. We're working on that. So we've got engineers, metallurgists, geotech guys who are you know, looking at the design of that at the moment, looking at updating the studies. We, re, we put in the permit, we drew the open pit permit, put the open pit permit. We've been told it's going to take a couple of years to go through the process, getting it granted. In the meantime, we're going to do the, the pre-fees uh, and, um, and the full feasibility study get that done so you know you put that that information into the uh, in, into the sausage factory and it takes a while to to go through and, and and get the results through so and when you know material results come you know we'll, we'll announce that to the market so we, we continue to do good work there that uh, you know Glenn uh, Glenn Van Vleemans you know leading that team at the moment so that's uh, he's extremely busy which is which is great um, and uh, we still got one rig churning away it went did collect a 10 tonne of sample during the MET sample, and we, that's now on the expiration, but one rig, five day shift only, five shifts a week, drilling, drilling you know, three or 400, 500 metre deep holes. You know, it, it's hard to get one hole drilled, it takes time to get the hole drilled and assessed, and then, you know, uh, in terms of into the lab and getting some results back. So, and you know, we're not looking just for 10, we're looking for, whole range of elements and those those sweets those, those um, element sweets are, are complex and take time so again you know we're, we're waiting for results to come back from from that work um, 
then uh, you know getting onto our um, chalice joint venture um, you know we've, we've had them down there drilling away doing all all good program they've, they've completed a few holes drill holes so you know we're waiting for results from that so hopefully you know towards the end of in the next month in July um, we expect uh, late July some some data from that and, and from the auger program which they've completed so they've got all that work done before the rain set in down there near Manjum up so uh, you know looking forward to uh, updating the market on, on, on those results from that, from that work um, and uh, you know and, and we've got a uh, schedule in a uh, an airborne EM survey um, so we're spending about uh, $300,000 on a survey there um, probably next quarter, um, hopefully towards the end of next quarter. So uh, that's booked in coolant. So it'll be very interesting to see what's. Uh, you know, we've got 600 square kilometres. We've got um, two 20 kilometre long sort of in, you know layered mafic intrusives complexes that have been sort of delineated. Two, two 20 metre one, two 20 kilometre ones, sorry, and one 10 kilometre one. So we'll cover the whole area so we can start pinpointing. You know, we've got some EM anomalies about focusing on those area and areas and developing drill targets. So, looking forward to that work, and we are uh, in the throes of getting you know uh, some EM done, probably hopefully next quarter um, at uh, Golden Grove North, some ground EM where where uh, we couldn't get the airborne EM done because the area is too small to do by airborne. So, yeah, they, the getting EM surveys done is just you know been again, you know we're in a boom market. Everybody wants to do. All expiration all of a sudden, and, and there's a bit of a queue. So, um, so when there's a, bit, a little bit of a holding pattern, which is, which is, you know, probably frustrating in terms of producing news flow. But um, you know, be assured that we're doing lots of good works happening at the same time. Where we're not sitting on our laurels, and it's and uh, you know, once the borders have been opened, that's why I've got out there because we're looking for funding to build this mine. I need to, we need to establish these relationships with these with these funds that are very much got ESG at the forefront and, and, and sort of, and now because of, you know, those trips, and there's, there's groups in the US and the UK that are sort of interested in the story. So when the time comes to, to get the funding for that and if the, you know, the critical minerals uh, hasn't changed, the view of the government, even though the government's changed, if the view hasn't changed, which I believe hasn't, then, you know, that's potentially another avenue of funding for building this asset and, and, and rating it as a, you know, as a very important project for not only the state of Tasmania but for, for Australia and because uh, you, you won't see another tungsten, tin mine sorry, uh, being built. Uh, obviously our friends at King Island, uh, Group 6 guys are, um, are getting King Island mine up and running or the Dolphin mine running up again. Uh, but uh, you know, certainly in terms of tin, you know, we've got a rare asset and uh, we will continue to explore and hopefully get a secondary shortly uh, to, uh, to test those 48 EM targets, which you know we've we've hardly touched. You know, we've, we've had a crack at a couple of them so far, and we're following up the uh, Renison mine sequence as we speak, and uh, and trying to find. Uh, you know, for us, it's not a matter of if, but when we will make the next tin discovery at Mount Lindsay, and, and there's no better place in Australia than than being a long strike to the Renison Bell tin mine. All right, well, look, you know, it's good, good sort of update you know as i said early on I, I really wanted to get the tin story out because it's not every day you have a tin conference that comes off uh, and and tin is a very awkward commodity in terms of like you mentioned before it's small you sort of don't see it don't feel it but it's a it's the glue to our life today it's it's, it's uh, as i saw in the presentation right it is really we need tin for everything we use today Anything that's sort of IoT, Internet of Things, if you don't have solder, you're in trouble, effectively. Um, look, Andrew, thank you for the update. Uh, appreciate that. Um, any last words for guys out there? Well, look, I think a um, bit of patience. We'll get there. Um, we're beavering away. We're pushing pretty hard. So, you know, our view is to try and get a tin mine into production by 2025. That's what we're pushing towards, and certainly, uh, you know, we've we've got support of government to, to achieve that, and uh, you know, you'll see results come out shortly um, on on that plus chalice. So, so things will happen, and, and certainly, if you have the longer term view about 
Australia's next new tin mine. And if you're talking, thinking about ESG, then you know, there's no asset I don't think I, can, I know of in the world that's better placed in a, in a jurisdiction. It's, easy, it's much easier to build a tin mine in Tasmania than it is in Europe, for example. Um, you know, and that's why you know, the Americans and, 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 and the English come to Australia to come and find, we can, we can develop these assets in a sustainable way to give them the product to develop and build the things they need to, to do this transition for decarbonisation of the world's economy. And effectively, as you would have seen the four quarters report, um, you know, to sustain this change, we need the world needs more mines, and that's the bottom line. And bizarre as it may sound, that's what you know the government is saying. Yeah, I think the the takeaway from everything is that you know, for us to go to that next level, to leave this no emission or very low emission world, we need to actually mine more minerals to create that. So. Um, Good way to end. Thank you, Andrew, and until next time. Right, thanks, Andrew.